Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Because, I mean, that was like, you know, a couple of days ago. You know, you got to move on. You got to say Happy New Year now. But, but I, I wonder if, if we were to wake up every morning saying, it's Christmas, that maybe that would really get us in touch with this gift that God would want us to experience on a daily basis. You know, Christmas is a gift that keeps on giving. You know, uh, m- most of us w- would think about, you know, what, what, what can we give somebody else would be more than just a moment in time, more, more than just something that they would enjoy for that opening that up and you know, maybe just for uh, an, an aspect of time, but, but rather a gift that would be something that you would enjoy on a continual basis, moment by moment. I, I, one of the things that, you know, we kind of... Uh, draw names and and uh, so we give to one another and we we make lists for that person that has our name and one of the things i asked for this this christmas was was gloves because i i'm outside a lot and it gets really cold and and so just having a nice warm pair of gloves you know and I, I just used them the other day and i'm like wow this is this is this awesome gift man this is a gift that's going to be you know i'm going to use on a daily basis you know and this morning when i was driving my car it was freezing in my car and, and my hands were warm and and, and life was good it was a gift that kept on giving but I I want us to I want to suggest this morning though when we get up and we our eyes open up do we do we think about the gift that we have in that moment I, I, I mean just even the simple things like the gift of being able to know that we can see or hear or some of us takes a little longer that we can get out of bed that you know that we can walk that we have water in our faucet, that we have a roof over our head, that we have a refrigerator we can go into and we can get out some food. And, and, and so those are all really gifts. But, but I'm wondering if the greatest gift that we miss on a continual basis, morning, uh, morning by morning and moment by moment, when we get up, do we, we acknowledge the reality that Emmanuel is available, that God is with us? Do we recognize that? Or, or do we just think about all the things I know that I have a tendency to do is I get up and I, the first thing that comes into my mind is not to be grateful, but my first thing that comes into my mind is all the things that I need to do. All the things that have to get accomplished. Okay, what's on the list today? What's on the plate today? What is it that's gonna have to happen today? Or maybe some of you think about your children or your grandchildren. Or, or, or some of you might be thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to, to be able to go and do this thing I've been looking forward to do for a long time. But I wonder if the first thing we did each day was to open up a Christmas gift that's waiting to be opened. That when the alarm goes off or however you get up, that, that you recognize that there is a, there's literally a gift waiting for you to open that day. Just like Christmas. You don't have to have a tree. You don't have to have uh, UPS. You don't have to have FedEx. It's a gift that's available in the moment if we would just be willing to recognize it. And the best part about this gift, the best part of it is that it's a gift that keeps on giving. It, it's a gift that you just don't think about just one moment in the morning, but, but rather it's a gift that day by uh, moment by moment throughout the day, it's a gift that cont- continue to give. And so I want to just kind of think about some of the things about this gift um, that we could open called Emmanuel, God with us. And, and there's a passage in the book of Lamentations. Now, I'm sure most of you have read the book of Lamentations, probably committed most of it to memory. But, um, you know, it's, 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 not, it's a sad book. It really is. And it, it, there's a passage here, though, that is, that's really awesome. And it was a passage that Carmen, on a Wednesday morning, uh, he... It, he often does it uh, now, but, but oftentimes he would pray this passage, uh, you know, uh, paraphrase this passage for us on Wednesday morning when we get together and pray at 545, which everybody is welcome to do, by the way. That would be a gift to give yourselves as well as we take those uh, cards that you filled out this morning and put prayer concerns down. There's a group that comes every Wednesday, 545, and, and prays through those cards. And, and this is a passage that oftentimes is how we would begin that Wednesday morning. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, page 817. Uh, 817 in the book of Lamentations. If, if you've got a Bible that you brought, that's chapter 3. And, and I want to I wanna read f- verses 22 through 23. 
in the book of Lamentations. Now, as you're turning to that, I, I want you to be aware that this was a really bad time. Uh, Jeremiah has been called the, the, the weeping prophet. And it's because Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jew Jerusalem and Jerusalem's enemies were even making fun of Jerusalem's destructions. In fact, if we looked at Lamentations 1, it says, in the days of her affliction and wanderings, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in the days of old. When her people fell into the enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. And, and so here's Jeremiah sitting in the ashes of Jerusalem and the, and the book is just lamenting. It's, it's, it's a, uh, an expression of grief and sorrow about the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and, and he was, it was a dark time, and he was probably in a dark mood, and he was probably angry, and he was in misery, and he had little hope. And yet this one thing, this one thing that he realized, this one gift that he had in the midst of all that destruction, we find this in Lamentations chapter 3 starting in verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In the midst of all that was happening in Jeremiah's life, the thing that he wanted to remember is that God is with him. And that God is there for him in the midst of any situation. And he realizes that every morning we can unwrap this expression of God's presence in our lives. That he desires, God desires to have us experience his presence in every moment, regardless of what might be going on. And the first thing we find there that Jeremiah, when he opens up this gift, is the Lord's great love. And which reminded Jeremiah that God would never let him be overcome. That God loves us so much that no matter what the circumstances might be, what, no matter what the crisis, no matter how our, our health situation is, or our economic situation, or whatever it might be, God's in the midst of that. And God never says, oops. And he'll always be there for us, even in the midst of that. Because the greatest gift that we can open is God's love. And that love is demonstrated in the fact that his son died on the cross for us so that we can have a different identity. John tells us in 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that he did not, they did not know him. And so this great love... Jeremiah understood this great love is this love of relationship that the father has with his children. Back there with Jeremiah, it was the Israelites. For you and I today, it is the body of Christ that he loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us so that now we can be his kids. Man, I'm telling you, that's a love, of, a gift that we should open every day. The first thing I should think about is, thank you, God, that I'm your kid. That you love me enough that I have been adopted by you through your son's death, burial, and resurrection. And, and so Paul understood that when he, when he wrote in the, um, uh, in, when he wrote, for you did, not receive, um, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again in fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We know that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. That's, I'm sorry, 1 John 3, 16. Every morning we can open up our eyes. Do you understand the gift that God wants to us, his love, that we could actually come into his presence? And if you even, uh, the Arabic right now, if you go in the Middle East, you can hear children say, Abba, Abba. That we can go into the presence of the creator of the universe and go, Daddy, Daddy. And know that we have the identity of being his kids throughout that day. So that whatever we might face, whatever that might happen in our life, we've got a heavenly father that's there with us in the midst of it and desires his best for us. For this is the great love of God who is rich in mercy for us. 
He has mercy on us. And Psalms 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. And so not only can we have this relationship with Abba, Father, our Daddy, but this great love also says that, you know, all the stuff that's inside, all that self-centeredness and all that crud, all that things, all that stuff that the Bible calls sin, that can be blotted out by the burial, death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we can come into his presence innocent based on what Christ did for you and me. You know, the Lord is mighty to save us. He'll take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Can you picture with me right now that the creator of the universe sings for us? That, that his joy for us is so great. Literally, that, that Hebrew says, he rejoices over you with a shout of joy. Now, I don't know about you, but, but being a grandfather, that's, that's one of the, I love being a dad, but being a grandfather is just, it's just different. And it's just such a great joy. And I can't wait. We Skype with our grandkids back east almost on a daily basis. And, and every time I see them, I just want to shout with joy for those little kids. But I have Abba Father in heaven that's doing the same thing. His mercy on me, according to the unfeeling love, according to the great compassions, blots out my transgressions so that he can take great delight in me and quiet me with his love as he rejoices with me with singing. I, that's the kind of compassion and love that, the God has, that God has for you. Psalm 69 says, but I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor and your great love, O God, answer me with sure salvation. So every morning I would ask that we might consider this thing called Emmanuel, God with us, recognizing that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and that's how God demonstrates his love for us. That every morning it's a clean slate. Every morning we can wake up and, and we don't have to worry about the baggage that's behind us, but we can look forward to the, the gift in front of us every day. And that we would might come to mind that God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son that if we would believe in him, we won't perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Emmanuel. The gift to open up each day and to make Christmas every day of the week is his great love that he loved you enough to die on the cross for your sin and for mine. So Jeremiah, in the midst of this destruction, in the midst of the ashes, in the midst of the misery, in the midst of the anger, in the midst of all the things that were occurring in the Israelite people, he says, but you know what? I'm going to hang on to God's love because God's love can provide me the strength and the hope that I need. But another thing that Jeremiah realized is that God's compassions never fail. They're new every morning. The, 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 it, it, it's something that we can experience just like it was the first time, if you will. The word in the Old Testament for compassions is a feeling of attachment with an intimate, familiar relationship such as a mother and a child. That word is used in Isaiah 49, 15. It says, can a mother forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? It's the type of compassion that a mother has for, for a child. Now, now I, I, I have to admit to you, I've never been a mom. But I, haven't, I know on good authority that you never, get, you never get between Mama Steph and her child. You don't do that. You, you know, a, a, a mother bear and a cub, that's called suicide. Because there's such an intimate relationship that, uh, and, you know, not that us dads can't have that same kind of intimacy with our children, but it's a, I think it's a different intimacy. There's something unique about a mom. There's something unique about a mother and a child's relationship. And that's the compassion that God has for you and me. It's that kind of intimacy. It's that kind of attachment. It's that kind of relationship that he has. And so we find in Psalms 103, as a father has compassion on his ch children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. 
that you and I could open up this gift of great love for, that God has for us, but that love is expressed then by his compassion for us. And that it's just like a, a father and son, uh, and, uh, a father and son, or a father and daughter, or a mother and son, or a mother and daughter. It's this kind of compassion that has this connection in the hearts, if you will. And, and, and it was lived out in the reality of his son, Jesus Christ. And so he brought flesh to this word compassion, if you will. Look in the New Testament see all the times that Jesus used the word compassion or it was identified with what he was feeling at that moment. We know in the Greek that term was, um, not to be gross, but literally you could say the term for compassion in the, in the Greek was guts. It spoke about the bowels, if you will. Because it was, in the, in the old King James translation, the plural form of the noun bowels is quite close to literally meaning of the term. And the English word guts captures the sense of the word and its literal and figurative meanings. Because it was really talking about the body parts specifically uh, of those that, of sacrifice, uh, sacrificial animals such as the heart, the liver, the lungs, and the kidneys because that's where the, the emotion, that's where the compassion dwelt the, uh, from the Greek perspective. And so we see then when we, when we hear Jesus had compassion, it, it was in the depth of his being that he was feeling toward those people. It, it was more than just a feeling, though. It was, it was something that was about his life, that, that he wanted to do something for them because of that compassion. Uh, Matthew 14 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We find in Matthew 14, also that when Jesus landed and saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Another time when they were hungry, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry as they may collapse on the way. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. When Jesus landed on the other, uh, the other side, a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. In another passage in Mark 8, so he got up and went to, to his father, the, uh, the prodigal son parable. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Paul understood it when he said for 2 Corinthians 1, praise to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. In Philippians 2, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness or compassion. And as you know, we consider those who have persevered. We have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We have a God that's compassionate. We, have, we saw it in his son that when, he, when his son was here on earth and he saw the people and he saw how desperate they were and he saw how helpless they were, how lost they were, his, his, his belly ached for them. That's the gift that God wants you to open up every moment of the day. Emmanuel, God with us, that he's compassionate toward you. That his belly aches for you. That he cares about you. That he desires to come alongside of you. That he desires for you to walk with him in that day, in that moment, in that hour. So that you might have his best and experience his blessings. And in order, and then after we've done that, then to become a conduit of his compassion, as Paul tells us in Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In other words, as we receive his compassion, as we understand how much he loves us, as we understand how much he cares about us, that we put that same coat onto us now, and we become his hands and his feet and his eyes and his ears, and we become his compassion to those around us so that people might experience the compassion of God. This is a gift, I hope you're understanding, this is a gift that keeps on giving. Every day can be Christmas when we understand God's great love and God's great compassion. And then finally, Jeremiah realizes that God's faithfulness is great and it's certainly able to keep him in the midst of the difficulties that he was experiencing. 
that in the midst of the most terrible time, one of the most terrible times in Israelite's history, that God's faithfulness will carry him through, that God's faithfulness will keep him um, centered around what God has desired. Deuteronomy 7, 7 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He's faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. You have a faithful God. Emmanuel, God with you, recognize that when you open that up, you don't have to wonder how God's feeling that day. You don't have to go, you know, God, are you having a good morning? You know, I, I don't want to, you know, I know if, you're, if you're kind of bummed, I, I, I'll wait, you know. You don't have to wonder about where God's at. You don't have to wonder about God's heart. You don't have to wonder if he's having, you know, if he got up on the wrong side of the bed. Isn't it great that we have a God that he's faithful and that, that, that he, never is, he never changes his love as, like it was yesterday and for 10,000 years from now? He's a faithful God. And that we can literally be able to be in his presence and realize that he never changes, but he's always there and he's faithful. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. You see, God desires always to keep us from something that's going to hurt us. That God never wants us to have something that's going to interfere with our relationship with him. We know that there is no temptation that seized us except that is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will always provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. We have a God that not only does he love us, not only is he compassionate to us, but he's going he's to keep you from messing up. The question is, do I want to keep from messing up? See, the question is, do I want to be able to, ex to have his faithfulness have an effect on my life in that moment and in that day? God doesn't want us to hurt. He doesn't want us to mess up. He doesn't want us to walk into walls. He doesn't want us to have broken relationships. And so that when the enemy comes along and the enemy wants us to be self-centered and when the enemy wants us to get angry and bitter and resentful and when the enemy wants to mess up our relationships and when he want, the enemy wants to mess up our, our lives and however possible that can be, the enemy's always continually trying to get this thing messed up. And God's continually saying, but I love you and I have compassion for you and that I will be faithful to you if you are just willing to be faithful with me so that I can make a way for you to get out from under whatever it is that you're facing. But we've got to acknowledge to him that we mess up. We've got to say, just like um, John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confess literally means in the Greek we have to agree with. So we have to get to a point in our lives that on a moment-by-moment -moment basis in the morning, we, we have to agree with God. we got to confess, you know what, God? I realize today I'm going to be in charge. I know there's going to be a moment where I'm going to want to be God. I know there's going to be a moment where I want to be self-centered. I know there's going to be a moment where I want to be selfish. And I agree with you, God. That's, <laughs> that's a problem. But you know what? If I'm acknowledging the fact that that's what could happen in that moment, you said that you would give me a way that I don't have to be selfish. I don't have to be self-centered. I don't have to be angry. I don't have to be all those things that I so normally tend to have a tendency to be. Because you'll find a way out of that when I turn to you and your faithfulness will open and provide me what I need. Forgiveness and purity from all unrighteousness. He's faithful to give me a new heart. He's faithful to give me a new direction. He's faithful to give me different emotions so that I might have that relationship with him that he desires so desperately, that intimacy, that father, son, or daughter relationship where we can say, Abba, what is it in this moment that you have for me? What is it in this moment that you'd want us to experience together? God's so faithful and his love is something we can experience every moment of every day if we'll just walk in the reality of Emmanuel. His love, his compassion, his faithfulness. Let me ask you to do something we don't uh, often do, but turn to, with me, if you will, to Psalms 136. 
That's on page 617, 617, if you would turn to that with me, if you will. And I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And I want to do what is, uh, the old school people would remember as a responsive reading. And we'll see in one Psalm, Psalm 126, I'm going to read a phrase and then you're going to respond, his love endures forever. And I want this to be an opportunity for us to experience this reality, for us to experience the truth of the passage. And that it, hopefully it would give us um, a tool that we can use on a moment-by-moment basis as we wake up in the morning and experience Christmas every day as we remember and even maybe use Psalm 136 as a time of devotion on a moment-by-moment basis. So as I read the phrase, will you respond with me? His love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to God of gods for his love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spreads out on, over the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the right night, his love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea, his love endures forever. To him who led his people through the desert, his love endures forever. Who struck down the great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Shion, king of the Amorites, his love endures forever. And O king of Basham, his love endures forever. And he gave their land as an inheritance, his love endures forever. And an inheritance to his servant Israel, his love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our low state, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. And who gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Father God, we just want to be in your presence to thank you that your love endures forever. A love that adopts us as your children. With compassion that you hurt for us in every moment of the day that we're hurting. And that your desire is for us then to know you so that we might replace that hurt and that pain with your love and your compassion, your grace, your mercy and forgiveness. Thank you, Father, that you're so faithful that your love endures forever. And help us to open that give up every moment of every day as we allow Emmanuel to be our experience. Lord God, if there's somebody here in this morning that is in our midst that doesn't know your Son as Savior and Lord, that needs to experience your love will endure for them forever. I pray this would be the morning that they would change their eternal zip code to heaven by receiving your Son as Savior and Lord. Father, many of us, if not most, have made that choice and decision to have your Son as Savior. But Lord, help, him, help us now to make him Lord. Help us to be in your presence every moment of every day. Help us to realize that your mercies are new, that every day can be Christmas for us as we would allow you to be with us and more importantly, for us to be with you. Father, I pray this would be the beginning of a year of Merry Christmas every moment and every day that we wake. And we ask this in your son's name, amen.